All right. Uh, good morning to the 30 of you that are here today. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to, uh, to Comp 3350 Software Engineering. Um, today, we are going to be focusing on a project management topic. This is not the first time that you've done project management in this course. Uh, a lot of the stuff that we did initially, so going through this process of vision, envisioning for our project, coming up with features or, or epics and user stories, and then trying to plan those things out into different releases and iterations, those are all project management related activities. So you've been participating in some project management stuff already. One of the other jobs that a project manager has is to monitor progress. And that's what we're looking at today is the idea of monitoring progress. This is not a heavy topic. This is not like a big, huge thing that we're going to be thinking a lot about. I'm a realist. You know, things are due on Friday. We don't need to tack a bunch of extra stuff on right now. So let's stick with something a little bit more straightforward today. Uh, so what I want us to do today is spend some time talking about measuring progress and then uh, using those measurements to think about how we can analyze what we've got and how we can think about adjusting plans going forward. So adjusting plans here might be, I have a plan that's made already and I'm going to make changes to that plan, or it might be, I haven't yet made the plan, but how I make the plan is going to change based upon what I've made observations about right now. If you got to work on your project, I'm okay with that, but it, please don't talk because you're disturbing other people. Thank you. All right, so let's talk about uh, let's talk about measuring progress. You have been working on this project now for quite a while. You've been working on this project for about two months, really. From the beginning of the very first class, we started working on this project, and now you're two, almost two releases into it. Hooray, hooray. Congratulations that you're almost ready to release another version of, of your product, your project. In this course, the, the end of your project is coming soon, because there's just not going to be much more after you release the last part of it. In the real world, your project isn't going to be finished for a lot longer than just three months. It's not going to be finished for a lot longer than four months. It's not going to be finished for years, possibly. This is something that you're going to be building on for a really long time. Because this is something that you're building for a really long time, there are different stakeholders that are involved in this whole project and product that you're trying to build that are really anxious to get their product. They are really anxious to get their product. Your customer wants to know when the project is gonna be done. Your project manager, your company would have worked with your client originally to kind of say like, this is a three year project. This is what we're gonna do in three years. But as you're building the project and making releases to your customer, and as you're learning more about the product that you're building with your team, the plans that you're making are going to change. The customer really wants to know is, is how much more time is it going to take for you to finish this thing? And alternatively, or just also, how much are you actually going to be able to get done by the end of the contract that we've established at the beginning of this project? You, where you're wearing project management hats right now, so take off your dev hat and put on your project manager hat right now, you want to know when I'm going through the process of building up a plan for the next iteration and the iteration after that, and then as far as is appropriate for you to be planning, what's a reasonable amount of work for me and my team to agree to commit to doing so that I don't burn people out, so that my team doesn't get burned out and they can't keep going? What's a reasonable amount that we can accomplish in the next iteration? so that we're not just sitting on our hands and doing nothing for half the time. 
every iteration that you're starting, so the first iteration, the second iteration, and now upcoming to be the third iteration, one of the things that your team is effectively doing is committing to a certain amount of work. So in this course, what you're doing is going through this process of we've got this big feature set that we've established at the beginning of the project. In the first iteration, you planned a bunch of user stories that were attached to that. In the second iteration, you did the same activity. You planned a bunch of user stories that you thought you would be able to accomplish after pulling in the stuff that you weren't able to do from the first iteration. In the third iteration, you're going to do the same thing. You're going to have these features that you want to accomplish. You're going to have stuff that you didn't finish in the last iteration. And you're going to commit to a certain amount of work. You and your team are all collectively going to say, I think it's reasonable for us to do this amount of work this iteration. I've already said all that stuff. It's what you as a team are thinking what you're going to be able to do, and it's the user stories and the features that you planned for that. At the end of that time unit, at the end of that time box, at the end of that iteration, you completed a certain amount of work. I've labeled these things A and, and B. So one of them is you've planned, this is what we think we can do for this iteration, for this release. This is what we actually were able to accomplish at the end of this release. The reality is that uh, A and B are rarely equal to each other. They are very rarely precisely equal to each other. The reality is you may have completed more work. So optimistically, you and your team might have said, hey, we're going to do this. And then you got to two weeks before the end of it. Wow, we have two weeks to go. Let's do more. Let's try to fit more into this release and pull stuff in from future releases. More realistically, you got to the like last 30 minutes of the release and said, oh, no, we can't finish any more of these user stories. We have to push stuff out. So we've probably completed less work than we thought we were able to complete. And that's, that's totally OK. I have a, a discussion question for you. I want you to talk about this briefly with your team. We've got these two scenarios. You, you completed more work. You set the goal line, and you just ran way past it. Or you've done less work. You set the goal line, and you, you either just barely met it, or you did less than you thought you were going to do. Take two minutes to talk about this. Is completing less work a failure? Is it a failure? I want you to think about this in terms of like what it feels like to get to this point of saying, we said we were going to do this and we didn't. So this is just like internal personal feelings. This is nothing about assessment in any way. But also then about assessment. So if you planned a bunch of stuff and your team was able to accomplish it or they weren't able to accomplish it, how was that reflected in the assessment that you were given as part of this project? Take two minutes to do that. I'm not going to ask for feedback. I want this just to be localized discussion with your team right now. So take two minutes to do that. And then we're going to move on to, uh, to continuing with this. Please go ahead. All right. So is less a failure and is more a success? There, there's a little bit of a constraint I want to add to this. And the constraint that I want to add to this is uh, thinking a little bit more about a, a, a realistic scenario that's, that's not a university course. The realistic situation in a university course is, um, well, uh, we've got two weeks left. I'm finished everything we were said we were going to do. I've got other assignments to work on. I will not work on this project anymore. I'm finished. I'm done. I'm not going to go past this. And that's, that's fine. You're not getting paid to work on this project. You're not really. I don't know, maybe maybe you are intrinsically motivated to want to get this thing like working amazingly, but uh, the realistic situation is I've got other assignments to do. I've I finished this early. I'm just not going to work on it anymore. Is less a failure? Has the project failed if you aren't able to meet the goals for an iteration of the project? And and my opinion on that is is no. The project has not failed if you haven't met goals for one single delivery of a project or a product. 
you'll talk about this a lot more in project management. If you take project management in your fourth year, even getting to the end of the project and not meeting the vision that you had established at the, at the beginning of the project is still not necessarily a failure. It's still not necessarily a failure. You need to start thinking about things like, is the customer and everyone actually satisfied with the product that you've built? Does it meet the needs of whatever they wanted to pay you for in the first place? Does it actually meet those needs? Failure and success is kind of this wishy-washy, like it's hard to establish clear criteria unless you've got success criteria in your vision and then you can measure or not whether you have met those success criteria. But again, it's kind of hard to say that it's a failure if you haven't met those success criteria. Okay, let's move on. One of the things that we're trying to do by measuring how much work has done and, and how much we have been able to do and looking back at what we thought we were going to be able to do and then measuring how much we were actually able to do is that we wanna use that to guide us going forward. Planning is this entire exercise of just trying to predict the future. It's, it's, it's this exercise of saying, we want to be able to do this much, but we don't know that we're going to be able to do that much until we actually get there. Making observations about what you have been able to do in the past can help guide you make decisions, informed decisions, educated decisions about how much you should reasonably be able to do in the future. The measurement that we are going to take and establish as what is reasonable for our team to be able to do is something that is called the project velocity. This is a link. If you wanna click on it in the course notes to uh, the extreme programming webpage, the extreme programming idea is an agile process that's been around for decades at this point. The website has also been around for decades. And uh, this has a pretty good description of this whole idea of project velocity, but we'll talk about it really quickly together right now. Project velocity is this act of calculating the estimates of how much work you said you were going to do with your team for this release. So this is the sum of all of the estimates that you've made for the planned tasks that you had for this specific release. This is not the project velocity itself. This is not the project velocity itself. The purpose of this is to make comparisons to what you're doing, to make comparisons to what you're actually able to do. The actual part of velocity here is calculating how much work was actually completed and this is the sum of all estimates for completed tasks. The sum of all estimates for completed tasks. These are both estimates. These are not, these are not actual time spent coding a task. This is what the estimate for that task was. Once you've got these two numbers, you plot these values in a chart. You whip out Excel and you put them in a chart. And the units that you're using for each of these things, these estimates are the same unit that you're using for estimating whatever it is that you're estimating. So user stories or dev tasks or whatever. If you're using hours to estimate your user stories, your project velocity would be measured in hours. If you're using story points to measure estimates for your user stories, you would use story points to have a project velocity. Here's a chart. It's a fancy looking chart. This is a velocity chart. Each of these things that we have on here is a sprint for some hypothetical team. On the y-axis, we've got a measurement of story points. But again, replace story points with hours or days or weeks or whatever unit you are using for estimating your work. And then what's plotted on this chart is the amount of work that was committed to. So this is what we initially planned to release for this iteration or sprint. This is what we were actually able to release 
and actually able to complete for this iteration. This chart is something that you, as a project manager, can use to help inform approximately how much work you and your team should be committing to going forward. This is a tool that you can use to decide whether or not your estimates are, are reasonable for the amount of work that you're able to do. I'm going to give you a little bit of time to do this. I would like you to calculate your velocity for iteration one and what you've got so far for iteration two. I, I know that if you're not there yet, you still have a whole day left to do user stories, but I'd like you to calculate your velocity for each of these iterations. And then using this chart, so try to make it look something like this. So if you've got a machine in front of you, actually start getting Excel running on there and make a chart if you can. How accurate were your estimates? So you planned to do a certain amount. How much were you actually able to get done, just on average? I'm going to give you maybe like five minutes to do this. So not a lot of time. Uh, all right. So if you have a velocity chart, great. If not, that's OK. I have velocity charts that we're all going to look at together. What I'd like us to do now is uh, given some velocity charts. So if you are able to take a velocity chart and produce it for your own project, what can you interpret from that? So again, project management hat on here. What can you interpret from a, a chart that you've got? First of all, yeah, if you are able to create a velocity chart, one, one iteration is not meaningful. One iteration is not meaningful at all on a chart because it's just one, one sample. It's one observation. It's not going to give you much information. Two iterations, it's two observations. That's definitely more than one, but it's still not really going to give you significant meaningful information about how to predict things in the future based on observations in the past. Another thing that, uh, that you kind of can't take from this is that velocity can't be compared between teams. This isn't a tool that's meant to be used to, uh, to have like the CEO or whoever of a company look at different teams and say, hey, their project velocity is higher than this other team's velocity. The way that different teams are making estimates are, are going to be different. So obviously, you're using days and hours and stuff in this course. And if you've done co-op work terms, you may have used something like story points instead. I've also heard of different uh, co-op employers using things like t-shirt sizes to measure the difficulty and complexity of tasks. Not only are units different, but if you start to think about well, you're all still in university. You're all still fairly fresh. You're still like not with a lot of experience doing things like working together in a team and building Android applications. The estimates that you make for your own stuff are probably going to be higher than somebody who's been doing this for five or 10 years. An experienced team is going to have a different velocity than an inexperienced team. A team that has groups of different kinds of people with different kinds of experience will have different kinds of velocity than different teams. Comparing these measurements is not a meaningful thing to do. It's not a useful thing to do. Let's take a look at a few different uh, kinds of charts. We're not trying to make comparisons between them. Again, we're just trying to draw conclusions about the state of the project from the velocity chart that we've got here. One observation that you can make from a chart is that you've got constantly erratic velocity. You've got a team that has committed to a certain amount of work, and sometimes they meet that, and sometimes they don't, but it's very frequently different. And it's also all over the place, up and down. It's sometimes very different from planned, either way too little or way too much. And then even from sprint to sprint, you have teams just saying, we're going to finish this much work, which is way more than the previous work, uh, way more than the previous sprint. 
going to give you two minutes to talk about this. What kind of conclusions can you draw about a team that's producing a velocity chart that looks like this one, specifically in terms of their ability to make estimates in the first place? Take two minutes. We'll talk about this when we get back together. All right. So uh, I'm going to pick on random number teams here. Uh, so we're trying to figure out what we can tell about a team's ability to estimate based on a constantly erratic velocity. So the first team I'm going to pick on is uh, team five. Team five. Team five. I feel like it's always up. Um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to random.org, and it's like, it's like this is all about true random numbers, and I'd say that it's truly random that you happen to be the first one that shows up every time. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, what do you have to? What do you think? Yeah. Okay. Um, but we were saying, like, it is moving up and down a lot. So that might be indicative of changes in the team. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I like the observation that you're making about this that the actual work that's committed to here and the work that's completed despite it being up and down and all over the place, those two things are fairly closely attached to each other. They're fairly closely attached to each other. I think the observations you're making are true about this. So estimating, it's actually fair to say that this team is pretty good at estimating because they're usually pretty close to where they think they're going to be. Other observations like it could be, this could be uh, spring break, this could be spring break. This could be the weeks leading up to spring break. So we can start to make observations about other stuff that might be going on with the team. Maybe, uh, maybe it's more like, you know, uh, March, and then April, and then May, and then July when we get the co-op students. Yeah. So I think those are good observations to make. Thank you, Team 5. Here's another velocity chart. The question that I want you to think about right now is that uh, if we look at this chart, the, the main thing that we can draw from this is that the team is constantly under-delivering. They are never delivering what they said they're going to be able to deliver. So they're committing to a certain amount of work, and they're always under-delivering. What does this tell us about our team's perception of what they can deliver? So our team, our team together, everybody is saying, we're going to do this much work. And then they get to that point of trying to do that work, and they're not getting it done. Take two minutes, and I will not pick on team five the next time. Uh, so here's our chart. We've got a team that's constantly under-delivering. Uh, the team that I'm picking on for this one is uh, it's Team 11. I'm picking on Team 11 this time. What, uh, what do you think that this tells us about the team's perception, their idea of how much they can work on, how much they can do? Yeah. 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 Has everybody heard of Dunning Kruger before? Stick your hand up if you haven't. If you haven't, sorry. Okay, so Dunning Kruger is this idea that someone that is that is, I don't know, falling prey is the wrong word. Somebody, somebody that is affected by the effect, somebody that is affected by the Dunning-Kruger effect is somebody that has this perception that they know a lot about something. And they have this perception that they know a lot about something, but 
The reality is they know just enough to think that they know a lot about something and to give themselves confidence that they have a lot of knowledge about something. They don't actually know that much. The other side of this, the other kind of reflection of Dunning-Kruger is this idea of imposter syndrome, which is, I don't know anything about this. I look at all my peers and they know so much, but I just don't know anything. But the reality is you actually know a lot. You, you know a lot. And it's hard to break yourself out of either of those. Everybody, everybody gets in those situations. I guarantee that by the end of 1020, you are all very much like we are pros at programming. And then you get to something like 2160 and suddenly you are demolished. You're demolished. Maybe you were fine. Maybe you were fine in 2160, but probably not. So this chart to me is that is a manifestation of this Dunning-Kruger. Every time we start an iteration, this team is saying, we're going to be able to do all of this. I guarantee it. And then they get to the end. Oh, we, we didn't. But it's going to be better next time. Okay, let's do it. We can do it. No, we didn't but it'll be better next time. Let's do it. No, okay, so they're constantly confident that they're going to be able to accomplish something and then never meeting that need. I'm going to leave this for you to think about. If this was you, if this was you, and it, it, it might be, it might be for two iterations, and that's painful for two iterations. If this was you forever, how would this affect your confidence as a team? How, would this, how might this affect your confidence as a team? I'm not going to ask you that question right now, but just, just something to think about. Here's the same chart. I'm going to put this on a different perspective now. We were just thinking about the team itself. In a real situation, the team is not acting independently. They might be, like if you're doing a startup or something, you might be saying, I've got this amazing idea. I am my own client. I'm going to build this thing for me. Realistically, though, you're building something for a client. You have a client. That person has demands. They want you to build this product or this project. What kind of a client do you think would lead to this kind of a situation? So try to, try to think about... What kind of a person would be asking you to do something, or even a project manager? What kind of a project manager or a client would lead to something that looks like this? I'm going to give you just like, yeah, two minutes again to talk about this. OK. So we've got the same chart. We've got this team that is committing to a certain amount of work but they're never delivering that. They are never able to deliver that. I've written on here what kind of a customer is asking for this or, or what kind of a customer are we dealing with, but I also want this to be from the perspective of what kind of a manager might be, be having in this certain situation. The team that I'm going to ask is, uh, is Team 16 at the very back there. So uh, we, we talked a little bit about a manager as opposed to a client. So what, can, you, can you tell us what we talked a little bit about? Project manager would be investigating the work, the, work, the work needed to be done by the team, okay. or rather, underestimating the limitations the team might face. So under, underestimating the amount of effort that the team of this specific manager is going to face. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, so Kripali, I, I, I really don't want to put you on the spot, but but you had a really good point when we were talking. So evaluating after you've done the first iteration. Okay. Constantly in a catch up phase. Uh-huh. Where you move to the work that wasn't done from the first iteration to the second work, where you don't adjust the second iteration. Right, okay. So that's so you committed, you and your team committed. You're the project manager, Kripali. You and your team committed. I'm making you a bad person here now, sorry. You and your team committed to this certain amount of work. You didn't meet that plan. But you are the project manager. We have to get this done next time. So let's just take what we had in iteration one that we didn't finish and stick it on top of iteration two and just keep going. We didn't get anywhere near that last time, but let's just do it anyway. Uh, now we're at iteration three, and we still didn't get that much planned. So let's take all the leftovers and put them on top of what we planned for iteration three. So never actually going through and changing the plan. I'm pretty sure Kripali's not doing that, but uh, that's a good idea of what this might represent. 
of manager that is kind of saying, let's just always catch up with the work. We didn't finish what we said we were going to finish, so let's finish it next time on top of what we planned. That chart might actually start to look like the blue bar just keeps getting higher and higher and higher, and the orange bar stays the same. You, as project managers for your projects, when you get a chart that looks kind of like that going up, it's time to start reevaluating how much you're actually committing to and changing the plan. It is okay to change the plan. It's okay to change the plan. Here's an opposite. We commit to a certain amount. We commit to this much, we commit to this much, this much, this much, this much. And yet every release, we're building more than we were asked to do. We're, we're able to complete more. My immediate, and I think that the obvious thing is like, hey, that's great, that's amazing that you're constantly over delivering. But what are the negatives of that? Now, I want you to think about a, a, like different stakeholders here. There are different people that are involved in the project. There's you, you are the dev team. There's your manager. There's your company, the whole company. And there's your clients. There's other stakeholders, but let's just stick to those four. You as a dev team, your manager, the whole company, and the clients. What, what ways are they negatively impacted by having this kind of a velocity chart where you're constantly over delivering? I'm going to give you two minutes again. Please go ahead. Yeah, OK, I like that. That's good. OK. So the team that I'm picking on is. Uh, is, is team four this time, but it's like the collective team four, team six, team eight group that's there. Um, so I'm going to ask about three people here who the negatives are for. Who do you, what do you think their negatives are in terms of the dev team? So you as a dev, dev team, what's the negative here? Yeah. Okay. So one thing that could be an outcome here is that uh, you and your, your your project manager and you and your client all worked together and said, "This is what we're expecting to get back from this release." And you got to that point with your manager, and your manager says, "Just keep going." We're not getting feedback yet, just keep building something. And so you do, and you just deliver something more than the client was expecting to get in the first place. Your clients, a negative here that, uh, that could happen is that your client says, ah, I wasn't expecting any of this, and you did a bunch of that stuff wrong because you didn't even come and talk to us in the first place about it. That's good, I like that. What about the dev team specifically? Was there anything you said specifically about the dev team? I'm going to put you on the spot because you did say something about the dev team. The higher expectations, yes. Having higher expectations, you know, as you get more experience, that does make sense that the expectations for you as a junior dev would be lower than for you as a senior dev. That's fair. But if you're constantly in a state like this where you're over and over and over and over and over delivering, the expectation should be higher. This chart does not reflect that, though. This velocity chart doesn't really show that the expectations are changing. The expectations are just like level. They're baseline. They're always the same, and you're constantly over-delivering anyway. But if we keep planning this out, this might go higher to match that. And that would probably be OK. That would be fine. That would be OK. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just trying to make adjustments based on this. OK, thank you, Team 4. Here's the last one. Here is a velocity chart that I would kind of consider to be a reasonable expectation of what you would see in practice. Really far off at the beginning, and then slowly getting closer together. My question is broadly, and I'll, again, I'll give you just a couple minutes to talk about this, but I'm not going to ask for feedback this time. How can you use a velocity chart? Your velocity charts, 
really honestly are going to be, they're useless because there's only two points of observation here. But if you could have five or 10 releases worth of observations, how could you use that, again, as a project manager to inform the plans that you're making in the future? How does planning for sprint n plus one be affected by sprints n and all the way down to zero? Take two minutes, please go ahead. All right, so I, I, I mean, I'm just gonna project on you here. I, I think that this is a good looking velocity chart. It's terrible at the beginning and then it slowly starts to stabilize. The person that's building this plan that is generating this specific velocity chart is making observations. Okay, well, last time we did this, we were actually able to get this much work done. This commitment here might actually just be that. Like, that might be it. Just like copy and paste. We can't do anything new. We're not going to generate any new work for us to do. We're just going to, like, backfill. But then going forward, the amount of work that's in here that you're committing to reflects more closely what you were able to get done last time. You can start to make like increases here. It's reasonable to make increases as you become more familiar with the project, as you become more familiar with the product that you're trying to build, as you become more familiar with your team, the tools that you're using, the thing that you're actually trying to build. As you gain more familiarity and knowledge with this thing that you're working on, you can start to increase the amount of commitment that you're making because there's less work that goes into just figuring everything out. This is a good tool to help you plan going forward. So past iteration three and four, going off into the future. At this point, you should be able to uh, measure velocity for your own project. Again, as terrible of two observations might be. It's still an observation that you can make about your own project. You should start to be able to use this current velocity to inform future plans. So by analyzing these other velocity charts, you should be able to draw some conclusions about how you should proceed going forward once you have a velocity chart. That's it for today. We've got 15 minutes left. If you have stuff you need to work on with your own projects, please go right ahead. You just want to get the hell out of here and go work on some other course, please go ahead. Uh, I'll stick around until 1245 and then I will otherwise uh, see you all next week. Bye everybody.